Alrighty, joining me now is a UFC welterweight veteran who just picked up a massive win over Jacob Volkman, a 17-second armbar this past weekend. Please welcome Ben Killaby Saunders to the program for the very first time. Ben, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Of course, I really, really appreciate you taking the time today, Ben. Um, so let's dive right into this uh, fight. Um, Jacob Volkman, pretty name guy. Um, a, a tough test coming off your UFC tenure. D 17 seconds. Did you ever imagine that, that it, this fight was going to end in 17 seconds? Did that ever cross your mind? Um, I mean, yeah, I guess. I mean, I visualized the possibility of the first kick being a knockout. Um, <laughs> you always aim big, man, and you prepare for the worst and, uh, and then usually it works out very well. I I definitely made a record this time. Uh, I think my fastest before that was a 22 second finish, and now we're at 17. So uh, I I outdid myself and uh, got a new record there. So yeah, I'm I'm super pumped about it. Yes, how great did it feel to get back into the winning column after your loss to Patrick Cote this past January? Just how amazing did it feel to uh, get back into the W column? Man, it, it was uh, it's up there with uh, you know some of the best ones in my career. I uh, I trained my ass off. I've been improving dramatically, drastically every single day. I'm uh, I'm my own worst critic, man. And uh, that that Cote fight, uh, I was I took uh, I took extremely well um, in the sense of understanding what I did wrong, what I needed to uh, work on, uh, what preparations I might uh you know I need to tweak and everything. And then on top of that, I just uh, you know stayed positive and kept looking at uh, the upside of things and um, kind of focused in on my next task turned out to be my next victim and um you know that's how that's kind of how I get down man I go fight to fight and um if I'm smart I'm able to maintain that focus correct now you mentioned that this was uh one of the best victories for you anyways to date um on your UFC on your MMA record pardon um it, does that include your UFC victories? You have some thrilling uh, UFC victories, um, especially as of late. Does this really rank up against some of uh, your victories in the octagon as well? Um, yeah, I'd say, I mean, there was a lot of pressure going into this fight that most people don't realize. I mean, the pressure I put on myself alone after a loss is, is huge. And then, uh, you know, you add in the other possible factors of what happened and uh, how big a fight like this uh, was needed, you know, after um, the Cote fight. And, uh, yeah, man, it definitely, I, I mean, I don't know. It, you could also say the evolution of my game um, as far as, you know, I can look at some of my past victories and they are beautiful and they are amazing. Um but I think the greatest thing is being able to look back at all my other fights and, and see the true evolution of how far I've come. And um, that's what probably also makes it up, you know, so great. And on top of that, Jacob Volkman, man, he's a stud. You know, he his wrestling and his submission game and uh, and all that is, is top-notch. And, and this is stylistically, if you think about, like, my first, uh, my first go in the UFC and, like, back in the day, my biggest thing was wrestlers that can take me down, I'm in trouble. And um, I, I've worked very hard to make it so that's not the case. And, uh, in fact, it works in my favor now. And uh, I try to be dangerous everywhere, man. If I, can take, if I can make people feel the pain and not want to keep it standing, and they want to come into the spider web of doom that is me off my back or me sweeping and using my top game, I'm down with that. You know, I try to be uh, very well-rounded. Now, you say that you, you you had a lot of pressure going into this, into this matchup. Um, why was that exactly? Was that simply just because you're coming off a loss and, and there's always added pressure um, when you're coming off a loss in, in order to get back into the winning column? Now, I know you also were, were going through some uh, personal issues. You did an interview recently where you, you didn't talk too much about it, but was it kind of just a mixture of those things? Was it only one? Just talk about uh, why you had that pressure. 
Um, I mean, the pressure going into this fight predominantly was, you know, I was trying to, uh, I, 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 I keep a relationship with Joe Silva and, you know, he's a straight shooter. You know, he tells me what he's looking for and, uh, what I got to do. And, and that's what I try to do and, uh, and make happen. Um, the matchmaker for this event, uh, was Monty Cox. And when he hit up, uh, Joe Silva seeing, you know, what, uh, what UFC guys may have been let go that he would like to see in this matchup. Apparently I was the only name that Joe Silva gave him. And, uh, when Monty came at me, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't the greatest, uh, financial fight that I've ever had, but the opportunity, you know, added on top of that, I'm one of those gamers, man. I mean, that's taking a gamble, and uh, and I took a gamble, and it paid off. You know, I'm just hoping that uh, that they see that, you know. Joe Silva told me, because I was supposed to, I tried to get on that UFC 202 um, card uh, when Sean Strickland got hurt, and uh, Joe Silva totally tried to make it happen. He was like, yeah, man, if you can get your medicals done in time, and you can make the weight, well, you know, let's go, let's do this. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the USADA situation, which I completely respect and understand, but now it's in the play where uh, apparently I have to be under their, um, under their, uh, testing pool. Their, yeah, their testing pool in order to, for, for four months before I can, before I can get a, a, a fight in me, which, you know, works out for me. I mean, I'll do something. I mean, essentially, if I can get back in, I'll do something for two months, and then there's a two-month training camp right there leading into that four-month period. So, uh, you know, I'd make that happen. And, um, you know, he, he said that we'd talk after. And, you know, I've yet to talk to him, but he did, you know, he did take me from that. So, uh, you know, we'll see what it takes me. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think uh, – you know, I think I was able to make a statement, you know, not just to them, but to, to everybody, you know, in my weight class. I'm, I'm, I'm a tough dude, man. And, uh, and I believe, you know, that I can compete against the best in the world. So, you know, I'm looking forward to testing myself. Yeah, now you mentioned the testing pool, of course, there. Uh, UFC veterans that, that have fought in Octagon looking to come back uh, are apparently required to uh, go through four months of testing before being eligible to compete, uh, unless you're, of course, Brock Lesnar. Then then there's an exception. Or maybe, I, like, I don't know. Maybe it might have been... Uh, a situation I, I was I was standing alone, you know. I think this was all this is all brand new to everybody. You side of being here alone is brand new to everybody. So there's going to be circumstances and things that come up that uh, the sport is going to evolve with. And uh, you know, I'm just part of that evolution. So I guess partly I feel kind of honored for that. <laughs> we had the Brock Lesnar situation, and then the first of you know in, in UFC history was. Joe Silva trying to bring back someone that was in the testing pool and uh, for, as a short notice replacement, and now, now you know the world knows you can't do that. If we we're in the testing pool, we could be out for a day, we could be out for a month. For in my case, I was out for I think two months, and uh, you know the requirements now are we gotta we gotta wait that four month period. And all right, there we go. It sucked for me, you know, circumstances wise, because I. I was in shape, I was ready to go, and it would have been a great fight, uh, you know, for everybody and, and all that, but nonetheless, you know. Have uh, you have you entered the testing pool? No, I got I to gotta talk to Joe. Um, you know, hopefully I'll talk to him this week. I'm sure he's dealing with all of the UFC from this, this Saturday, so, you know. But the, gotta, but the plan is shot. to do so um, very soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, hopefully, hopefully that was, you know, good enough, and we can do this. Uh, if not, um, hell, man, I gotta make money. So, <laughs> you know, then it's, I don't, I don't know what the plan would be after that. Uh, essentially, look for another fight. Yeah. Now you you mentioned uh, Joe Silva there a few times. It sounds like you have a pretty uh, good and, and solid relationship with him. What are your thoughts on on Joe Silva uh, leaving the UFC within the next six months or so? I think it's going to be a very rough job to, uh, 
you know, to take his place. So I'm not sure what the plan is. I don't know what happens. I don't know if Sean Shelby tried to step up uh, and run it all. I think that is, there's a reason why there was him and Joe to begin with. I think that's a lot for, for anybody. Um, so more than likely, I would imagine they're going to have to bring someone else in to help with the load. Um, and I'm not sure if, you know, Sean would step up to where Joe was and then get a replacement for where Sean was or how any of that would work. But, um, you know, one thing I'll say is Joe Silva has put together, obviously to date, man, the most historic matchups in, in history of mixed martial arts. So, uh, you know, he, he definitely, I think should be the UFC Hall of Fame, uh, for that. And, um, you know, and wishing him the best. Obviously, he he, he got taken care of financially and was able to bounce out uh, on a good note. And, you know, I don't think anybody can complain about him wanting to not have to deal with all the drama of the job anymore. Right. Now, I, I, I want to clarify, I, I want you to clarify what exactly happened um, after the Cote win, or after the Cote loss. Um, a lot of people are saying, oh, Ben Saunders got cut from the UFC, uh, Joe Silva let him go, all, all of this. I, I want you to clarify. Now, I know you did that interview with uh, MMA Fighting fairly recently, saying that you actually were contemplating retirement at the time. Um, it is... It explain exactly what happened. The Cote win or Cote loss, of course, um, was the last fight on your on your contract. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong there. And then after that, what happened exactly? Um, I'm in hell, man. What's the job? Uh, it's hard. It's hard to be vague, but also I, I understand what everyone's coming from. Um, I mean, bottom line, dude, in the fight game. You need to have your, you know, your your close, uh, your your family, man, your fight family, whether you, your management, you know, your 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 fight team, uh, you know, ideally the promotion too. Like, you know, if everybody's fucking on the same page, um, then it's a it's a absolutely phenomenal, positive adventure. Um, but at the time, you know, after after the um the Riggs fight, a lot of shit went down, uh, you know, in my camps between coaches and fucking nonsense and uh, kind of messed some things up. Um, prior to that, I was having management issues, kind of messing that thing up. So I'm like, it's so fucking hard for people to understand. But, dude, if you don't have um, the correct environment to fucking – compete at the top of this game, it's a, uh, it, it's, it's a rough thing, man. And I kind of just felt frustrated that everything was falling apart that I felt was everything out of my hands. Like none of it is I, nothing I did. I felt, uh, was the reason, you know, um, I, I felt a lot of it was circumstantial and it, it was sad because it almost seemed like it was all coming even more from my success. So it was like the success was even worse <laughs> for it all. Um, and I was thinking about bouncing, man. I was like, I was feeling fucking kind of, kind of shitty about situations leading into the Kenny Robertson fight. And then after the Kenny Robertson fight, shit got even worse. And, um, and then on top of that, that's when my grandfather died. And then, um, and then I was trying to get on that damn uh, December card that was going to be in my hometown of Orlando. And uh, I was like, fuck it, man. If everything's just going to fall through and be, be shit, I might as well just fight in my hometown. Fucking, I'm a man of my word, man. I contractually agreed and committed to those four fights, and I wasn't going to just fucking retire and not, and not you know, uh, live up to my agreements, you know, um, and uh, and so that was the plan, man. I was I was hoping I could fucking just do my my last fight in my hometown. Um, it was going to be I, I just was factoring all these stars aligning, man. I was like, it's going to be my thirtieth MMA fight if you include the two fights I had on the Ultimate Fighter, you know. 
a big three zero. That that sounds like a fucking nice way to go out. Um, you know, and and all the fucking knowledge and experience that I have is just gonna, you know, I'm a very intelligent guy. You know, uh, I, I think I'm a very nice guy, and I'm I, I, I've been brought up a true martial artist. I would love to fucking not only show my skills and techniques and pass it on to my students, but also like you know show them the correct way to you know live their life. You know, be, live your life as a good person. Good things happen to good people. Fucking don't be a bully. You know, I don't want any bullies at my gym. You know, I'll kick you. I don't care. You could be a world champion level, but I don't fucking want that there. Like that's that's kind of what I was going towards and what I was leaning towards is trying to find the positive positivity in the martial arts as opposed to all the negative that was occurring around me. And, um, and then fucking and the fight didn't happen. The fight actually got pushed back an extra month, you know? Um, and I feel like it, it was just too much, man, because I ended up going out to LA to try to finish my camp out there. I was out there for eight weeks while I was out there. My grandmother died, um, and and I was like in a tough rough spot, man. Like uh, mentally, with all that going on to- on top of everything, I was just like, "Fuck!" Everything negative keeps fucking happening. The sport's so goddamn selfish with time. You know, I never get to fucking talk to my grandparents. I never got to see my grandfather before. I was supposed to see my fucking grandmother. I was hoping after this fight I'd be able to fucking see my grandmother. You know, and, and before in case anything happened because her health wasn't too good. It was like, God damn it, man, me fucking being out here, I missed it all. I don't I don't get to fucking see anybody. I was like, fuck this sport, man. And, uh, yeah, I probably got, you know, a little emotional about everything. And, and then I didn't want to fucking be alone in a goddamn hotel room in L.A. by myself. So, fuck, I was just doing two days every day. Just trying to stay the fuck out of the house and, you know, not think about bullshit. And, uh... I did my, you know, I tried to take control of my camp and be the head fucking guy, and, you know, I fucked up with shit. You know, the the things I did with Eddie were phenomenal. The things I did with Anthony were phenomenal. They gave me all their time, and, and, and it just sucks. I feel really bad and depressed that I was, I went out the way I did. I mean, we worked so fucking hard, but at the same time, I don't think I was getting the rest I was supposed to be getting. I wasn't sleeping as well as I should have been sleeping you know, two days every fucking day, Monday through Friday, is absolutely terrible for you, and it's not what I normally do. And uh, strength and conditioning sessions were kind of predominantly, you know, on me. And, um, you know, I kind of, I feel I probably flaked out on some of it, and, you know, whatever, man. Uh, I just know I was, I was, I was underprepared. Cote was absolutely prepared for me. Him and his camp fucking did a phenomenal job in preparation for me. You know, all the props to him in the world. He was ready for, uh, you know, what I was going to potentially be able to, you know, bring in there and go at him with. Um, so once again, props to him. And uh, it, it was really just get my shit together, finalize. You know, I, I can't let it all consume me. So I was like, I got my family shit together. And I, you know, uh, it, you know, I, I've, I've worked really hard to get my camp shit together, management shit. I've been trying to so hard to fucking just fix every goddamn aspect that's necessary to fucking make it to the top, man. I, I, I have the skill set. I can't be a motherfucking champion, and I see that because I keep improving. If I was fucking the same goddamn guy and I'm just the tough guy that's fucking good, but I, you know, but I'm not getting any better. Then it'd be like, fuck, man, maybe you should just look for money fights. But because I keep fucking improving so well, and when I'm surrounded by positive people that fucking know me, we all fucking work together really well, and it all fucking combines, when shit's on point, man, I feel unstoppable. I feel like no one can fucking beat me. And, I, and it only helps I'll fucking regret it every goddamn day if I don't fucking go for it, man. I got time still. I'm still young. I'm ready to fucking do this. Now, he- you, it sounds like you've been going through a heck of a lot um, in the past little while. It, is everything, though, that you've spoken about, um, besides, of course, your grandparents passing away, and my condolences about that as well, um, it's not like you can get over that uh, quickly, but every, everything, all of the, all of these other things you, you kind of uh, spoke about, is this all in the past now? Yeah, man. Dude, it took me... That's what fucking happened, though. Like... I kind of just fucking, after my last fight with fucking Cote, 
You know, I text fucking Joe Silva thanking him for everything. I knew it was a shitty performance, but I wasn't looking like I didn't honestly, man. I didn't think that you know if the UFC wanted me, I didn't think we left on bad terms. So I didn't think I was gonna not be eligible, I guess, to come back. Um, and um. Once again, fuck, man. I, I, it was, it was my fault for for not probably communicating correct with them and letting them know, hey, man, like I'm trying to get this finished. And then once I got that part of my life finished, I was like, okay, now we're, we're working on the camp. And I, I wanted to get everything fucking situated before going to them. You know, like I didn't want to waste their time. So I, once I got everything situated, and I'm like, fuck yeah, man, I'm feeling great. Everything's on point. Life's fucking positive again, and I got the fucking dream team put together, uh, put together again, man. We're fucking, we're ready to rock and roll, and uh, and then it was too late, and then that's kind of depressing too. But I was like, fuck, man, I'm I'm here to work my ass off, dude. I I don't need no fucking hand me outs. I've worked for everything I've ever done. It's been on me, you know. Not every, not everybody's just because you know someone fucking might know you or. I might have a fan base. I get it, man. I'll, I'll, I'm down. I'll fucking work my ass off, and I'll, I'll get to where I am, where I want to be, you know, through fucking action. I don't need to fucking sit there and say, hey, you know, this happened and that happened. That's why I kind of just, I didn't want to say anything. I was kind of silent about all this shit going on. I didn't want anybody to know there was problems. Um, It's depressing, or it's just negative to kind of talk about fucking negative shit, so... I saw no. I saw the best way to fucking get through negativity was staying positive, thinking positive, talking positive, and not even thinking like anything was wrong anymore. And then it all fucking I don't know. It all fell uh, fell together correct. Yes, that uh, very good to hear. Of course. Um, now after the Patrick Cote fight back in January, um, was cl- clarify again. Was the UFC interested? In, in giving you and re-signing you to another contract after that fight? I have no clue. I never asked them. I wasn't I wasn't trying. I knew the last fight we, I had was not only a loss, but it was probably one of the more uneventful, I feel, fights I've had. So in my head, I, I mean, uh, I wasn't thinking about any of that. It took me like a month or two before I even fucking felt ready to start fucking getting the camp together. So the last thing I was thinking about was, do I still have a contract with the UFC? I mean, for the most part in my head, I'm like, man, I know I I I know I can get a fight fucking in the in the entire world. You know, there's fights out there. I fucking, I'm a skilled athlete. I'm a skilled martial artist. There's going to be fights out there. So it's not like I was like, UFC would do a guy. I'll fucking never be able to fight again. I don't know. I like, that was never even part of my head. So you, you were desperate. To I, didn't, I didn't, no, I didn't reach out. So honestly, what it was is, uh, I was, uh, I was still dealing with fucking management issues. So I was like, fucking, I didn't really want to communicate with with them about shit <laughs> and uh and i told them hey man i'm just gonna retire like that was the easiest way to fucking just be left alone by everybody well not everybody by them now they might have fucking mentioned that to the ufc i don't know it's not like i asked them to it's not like i said hey go tell joe silver or dana white that i'm retired um so maybe they did that without fucking asking me and maybe they thought I was completely retired. I don't know. I was contemplating it, but I never once retired. I never was under USADA and retired. In fact, I was still under USADA even after the Cote fight, man. I had to fill out the USADA rules um, for testing uh, for that other quarter of the year. And I don't believe I even got taken out of the USADA pool till like sometime in May. Which is what sucks, because I was really only out of the pool, I guess, maybe a, probably a month and a half, two months, um, before 
before. Uh, I mean, that's actually how I fucking, I guess, found out I was I was gone. <laughs> it was because I got an email saying that I was out of the USADA pool. I didn't even know um, that it was. I don't know, game over, <laughs> uh, too too late, whatever, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of bizarre. So they did, in a way, release you. Is that fair to say? Or or was it just your contract expiring? I mean, hell, it might have been, it might have been, I don't know. Uh, I really don't know. I couldn't tell you. Um, I never had a, a personal conversation with um, Joe Silva about any of all that, at least not yet. I mean, but these are all great questions. I mean, I would love to know this personally. Right. <laughs> you know, I would love to know when when Joe made the call or, or, or the decision, what date that was, you know, especially finding out what date that was and when I found out. Um, you know, I don't know. Like, did my management know way ahead of time? Who knows? So for for this fight this past weekend against Jacob Volkman, um, did you, uh, uh, ahead of this fight, before this fight was booked, did you call Joe Silva and say, hey, I want another contract with you guys. I want to come back. Did you did you give the UFC the call? Um. Well, once again, the fight kind of got set up by Joe Silva giving only my name to Monty Cox for this particular fight. The only reason I took this fight was because, um, you know, because the opportunity was kind of weighed, weighed in on uh, the fact that it was a smaller show that doesn't pay as much. Um, and I took the gamble and I fucking went with it because, fuck, that's what I wanted. I wanted a, uh, Jacob Volkman, a tough fucking dude, 6-4 and four in the UFC, was on like a five or six fight win streak in the UFC. I mean, he's a, he's a legit a legit veteran, and um, a win over him played as big of a role in my financial success um, as actually just getting paid money to fight someone with uh, more money to fight someone without, you know, uh, as big of a name. So I saw that as, a, you know, okay, that's what this is. It seems kind of like it's like it's a potential feeder show. Um, so I'm down. Let's fucking do it. And, uh, and then when I was trying to jump on the UFC 202 and that fell through, um, I asked Joe Silva, hey, you know, uh, well, can I get in under the USADA four-month testing pool now? You know, so hopefully I, I, I could at minimum fight before the end of the year um, if the opportunity arrived. And, uh, uh, and he said, you know, to beat both men and then we'll talk. And that was the last... Um, I heard from him about, you know, anything like that. So that's why I'm hoping I'll talk to him this week and we'll see whether or not it was or wasn't. Right. Now, now Joe Silva getting this uh, you this fight against uh, against Volkman, of course, um, kind of shows to me anyways. I, I don't know if you agree, but it, it kind of tells me that they weren't necessarily interested in, in, in re-signing you. Um, do you, how, how ridiculous is that? Because, I mean, you returned, you picked up a, a fantastic submission, um, over Chris Heatherly, then you picked up two more wins, and you only dropped one loss to Patrick Cote, who, at the time, was on a huge run, and, and only recently fell to Donald Cerrone, so how, how crazy is it that you weren't re-signed, and, and it appears that Joe Silva wasn't interested in re-signing you until you got another win or two. So what's the question? I agree with you that I guess that is how it seems. Um, but what was the question? No, but what what I mean what I what I mean is how crazy is it that it, it, it uh, again it, it appears this way. I don't know for sure, but it appears that Joe Silva wasn't completely interested in you. How crazy is that considering you only had one loss in a row? Um, <laughs> I mean I don't know, man. I don't know. Once again, I would have to talk to him personally. We would have to have a conversation and kind of go back and forth about uh, points of view. You know, like I'm sure he had a point of view of why he made this decision. Um, and from that point of view, I would have my point of view, whether it's we keep going back with point of, points of view till we're both on the same page and both understand each other completely. Um, 
I've always been able to understand, look outside of fucking someone's perspective and see all the different perspectives that could potentially be, you know, taken. Uh, I don't know, man. Maybe my fight picked them off. Maybe, <laughs> maybe the loss. Maybe, you know, maybe not. Maybe him. There's a good possibility me not re-signing with them had him think that I was trying to go to free market as opposed to having management issues and fucking camp issues and fucking potential retirement. Or she just really was like, if your thoughts are retirement, just kind of like, uh, I guess Dana White's saying about GSP, you know, like if your thoughts are retirement and they're not, I want your motherfucking gold belt around my waist, then guess what? I can hire some other motherfuckers that really do have the drive to fucking go for it. And if that's the case, I completely 100% understand. I get it. You know, that's a perspective as a fight uh, matchmaker is, you know, I'm not here to just fucking have you be a part of this unless you're 100% and 110% committed. I mean, maybe that's what it is. Like, that's a perspective that I can look at and say, okay, that's why I'll shut the fuck up, take all responsibility, and fucking go out and murk Jacob Volkman instead of fucking compl- instead of complaining about it. Yeah, man, you just got to fucking suck it up, realize I might have fucked up. It might have been circumstantial. It might have been fucking lack of communication. Um, but because of those reasons, he could have a million different perspectives, and they could all be correct, you know? So I said, fuck it. I'll just deal with it. It is my fault. And uh, I'm going to go fucking make up for that and prove that I got my motivation back. And when I do, I'm a dangerous motherfucker. Well, there are certainly a lot of questions that are waiting for answers. I hope you get those answers from Joe Silva and from everyone else sooner rather than later, Ben. Um, thank you very much for taking time. Before I let you go, just let my audience know where they can find you on social media. And if there's anyone you'd like to thank or give a shout-out to, now's your time. Now, uh, thank you uh, for just, you know, the interview and the time. I truly appreciate it. I want to thank... You know, everybody at Bloody Elbow fucking lets motherfuckers all day. And, um, yeah, your guys' support is, honestly, man, it's hilarious because this has been an absolute roller coaster. And you guys, through the years, man, you guys have fucking seen the goddamn bipolar fucking living situations that I have to go through. But, um, man, the highs are super high, so... You know, I, I'll never regret, you know, any of the loads that you got to fucking uh, take along the way. Um, huge thanks to uh, fuck, um, Ricardo Laborio. Uh, huge thanks to Bobby Robert, Majiro Jim, Dutch Kickboxing, 100%. Some of the best in the world. And uh, obviously the mastermind, Eddie Bravo, to Planet. Um I'm going to thank uh, Brandon um, and Paulina and Michelle for um, protecting athletes. I want to thank Onnit for backing me up, Guard of Life, all you guys, man. Thank you.